In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu, mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Christ is risen. Welcome to another edition of the Meaning of Catholic Social History. We're going to continue to do historical shows because I think that the knowledge of history is a very important for our time, very important for understanding where things are going, where things have been. Uh, so this is part four, and we did a little detour into Mohammedanism, and there are links in the show notes below that goes to all the different parts of this to give you a background, but this is going to be a very general overview of this time period. And the reason is because our whole crisis is defined by this time period and there are many different complexities within it. And so we're going to try to get do just a very general overview, give some very basic introduction to this era. And then in future shows, we'll be able to go into more detail in specific areas, which are very important. For example, the pontificate of Pius the ninth pontificate of Pius the seventh, for example, um, these different Leo the 13th, different pontificates that are particularly important for this whole thing. So let's get into it. Uh, we'll see if we can do this in an hour is the goal. <laughs> we'll take questions. So we talked last week about Mohammedanism had continued to incur on Christendom, continuing to, to, basically you wage a thousand year battle with Christendom all the way up to 1683 with the fall of, or the failure of the siege of Vienna, which was saved by Our Lady. And this was also the feast, the origin of the feast of the Holy Name of Mary commemorating this. The Holy Name of Mary existed before this, but it now commemorates this raising of the siege of Vienna, the second siege. So 1683, that's when the Turks came all the way to Vienna, remember that was the capital of the empire, Roman Empire in the West. It was all the way to their borders. But after that failure, the Ottoman Empire began to decline. Now, what's interesting, this period, really 17, you can do count it from 1683 all the way to the present. This is the period of European dominance, dominance over the entire world. Remember the, 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 Colonials were going all over the world. They were spreading Christianity, but they were also dominating civilization. So what happened? The What happened was that the Ottoman Empire began to decline. They could not compete with European dominance just militarily. They could not compete. And the reason is because the Europe had developed science. And this is what E. Michael Jones talks about in Logos Rising. He explains why we talked a little bit about it in terms of the nominalism of Mohammedanism and how their philosophy, because they were nominalists, they could not, they could not create the science of Europeans. Europeans had logos, they had Christianity. And this is a whole nother show. We'll, we're going to have E. Michael Jones on next month, God willing. So we'll talk more about logos, but the idea is that their philosophy was perfected by the Christian revelation to understand the truth so that they could develop science. And so European civilization developed, the Ottoman Empire declined. So Europe, Europe gains military and economic dominance over the world through science, just being able to innovate through technology, whether that's militaries, military or just in trade, using all sorts of different things to create more products and create this, this uh, economic and military dominance. And so the Ottoman Empire begins to adopt European ways. They begin to import European goods and adopt European architecture. They're just sort of admitting the dominance of European culture. And then they are they start to invite Europeans over to teach them mathematics, teach them uh, science and military and artillery and things of that nature. And so it's ser the seriously serious decline. Now, European dominance over the world, Europe is the greatest civilization of the history of the world. And the reason is not because Europeans are the race of the Europeans. That is the racist narrative of the slave drivers and the colonialists, uh, the, you know, the bad colonialists. The, the reason is Christianity. That's why it's not, it has nothing to do with the fact that Europeans are the race that they are, that they have DNA. It has nothing to do with it. In fact, 
the Europeans during this dom period of dominance, they're actually rebelling against Christianity, many of them. We'll talk about that in a moment. And so even Europe, as it is corrupted and as it is rebelling against the church, is still dominant over every other civilization. And the reason is because of Christianity. Christianity makes Europe great. Europe doesn't make itself great. It's not Europe is the greatest, not because, again, it's not because they're you know, a great race or whatever. It's because of Christianity. And so that's why all of these other factors come into play. That's why they dominate in science and military and all these things come out because the philosophy is sound. They have logos. So they're able to develop that. So what happens is the Ottoman Empire declines. What happens is there's a reactionary movement within among the Mohammedans, the Sunnis, that is, and that is called Wahhabism. And this is in the 1700s, which is a reactionary movement against the decadence, in their mind, of the Ottoman Turks, and that they are, uh, they are adopting these Christian ways, these European ways. They're not Mohammedan enough. They want to follow their, their false prophet. So there's a movement called Mahabism, and that becomes extremely important because Wahhabism is a reactionary movement which is trying to follow Muhammad as closely as possible. This is in the 1700s. Uh, Wahhab dies, I think, 1792. I don't have the date here, but they are trying to establish Sharia, the Sharia, the, the, the Muslim law, uh, and so there's, they, they hook up with the Saud, the kingdom of Saud, and this eventually becomes Saudi Arabia. Now, at some point, the British Empire, and we'll get into more of the history in a few minutes, the British Empire begins bankrolling the Wahhabis and the Sauds because they're enemies with the Ottomans. The Ottomans are allied with the Germans in World War, World War I, and the, the Axis powers against the British Empire. The British Empire sees a strategic ally in the Wahhabis. So this is the economic origin of what we call the uh, Mohammedan liberal alliance that we see today. So the British Empire sees an ally against the Ottoman Empire. This is going into the 18 and 1900s. They see an ally here and they begin to bankroll this Wahhabis and the Saudis. And that's going to come to back to bite them in the 20th century when we talk about Saudi Arabia. So keep that in mind. We'll pause on that, but we'll continue. So this period... So Mohammedanism declines, and then it's going to resurrect later, and we'll talk about that. But this period, after 1517, Luther starts the Protestant Revolt, and between 1517 and 1776, it is a period of tyranny based on nominalism. We've talked about nominalism. It is the philosophy, basically, that might makes right. It's basically the idea that there is no universal justice. There is no universal uh you know, these, these things are not real. The, the Thomist would say that justice is in the mind of God. It, it is the Platonic form of justice is real. It is God, God's justice. But the nominalist would say that God's will comes before his intellect. And so the idea is, it goes a lot right along with the voluntarism of Mohammedanism, where one's will is what makes one's uh, what, what makes God's right. So God wills it, therefore it's right. And that's the nominalist thing. So that, that goes straight into the, the tyrants of what they call the, the absolute monarchy period, which is 1517 roughly to 1776. And then the final monarchs are not finally deposed or destroyed until World War, World War I. So this whole period, 1776 to World War I, is the destruction of monarchy. But the monarchs at the time, even the Catholic monarchs, they were tyrants. They were, they were exalting themselves to such a degree. So the Protestants, on the one hand, they were just using the church. They were just creating their own justification. But then the Catholics, they were, the Catholic rulers were trying to do the same thing as the Protestants, but then just using the church to do that. And so it's a period of tyranny which creates in the social order, like we talked about Henry VIII, he seizes all the church's lands and the church's lands were devoted to the poor. And so seizing all the church's lands hurts the poor. And now there's more money, with more property among the elites, the, the nobles of the, of the monarchy. 
and not being distributed to the poor. So there, there's a lot, a loss of the medieval, the so-called medieval Christian era monarchs who were much more limited in their power. They had much less power. It's much more subsidiarity. You know, their, their main power was calling up the, up the nobles to fight against the Vikings and they had taxation, but it wasn't as bad as this period of, of tyranny. So, but what happens is what we're going to see is with the, with the revolution of Republicanism, i.e. democracy, the principle of might makes right continues and it gets even worse. And the reason is because the monarch at least had to pay some lip service to divine order. They had to at least say, well, I am ruling by God's right. I, you know, there's an installation mass, there's a coronation mass. They have to justify this somehow. So, but the, with the period of democracy, they no longer have to justify anything. All they have to do is count up, count up the votes. And I know we have some Irish viewers and you know exactly what I'm talking about. All you have to do is count up the votes and that's what makes what's right. Well, that's not true. It's not simply a majority vote what's makes, what, what makes something true or false. It's not what everybody just decides that it's true or false. It's that, that is the absolute tyranny of the majority. It's the tyranny of mob rule is what it is. There's a great quote from, this is from Cahill. Um, once again, this is your essential work. If you want to learn about all this stuff, this is where I learned it. He says, page 454, he says, quote, seeing that the powerful frequently are able to secure in their own favor the decision of the majority through the operation of finance and of the press, personal rights have in practice little more security in the liberal, i.e. secular democracy state, than under the old pagan regime. Thus arise the exploitation of the poor and the tyranny of the moneyed interest, end quote. So he, what he's saying here is that in the... The, the so-called democracy, it's supposed to be everybody's free, but all the, the rich and the elites are able to basically just manipulate the vote so that everybody just votes for one thing. And then you've got, they, they've got their way. And this is what happened in Ireland recently with all these referenda was that uh, Google and all these international financiers, they use a great deal of psychological manipulation to just manipulate the popul uh, population of Ireland so that Ireland would vote a certain way. And there's other factors there, obviously, but that's an example of this. And we're going to go into the way that this affects things very uh, strongly. Now, the other aspect of this period is that there is a increasing amount of bloodshed and militarism. And so the French Revolution 1789 is the first popular draft where they're drafting ordinary citizens into the army that hadn't happened before. Now, before there was further, more and more militarism. So the 30 years war was a very bloody war ended in 1648, but the French revolution, 1789 begins to draft from the co common populace. And what you see, here's, here's the deception of the Republican revolutions is that in every Republican revolution, it is a group of elites who whip up a certain number of masses using rhetoric to convince them to bleed and die for some ideals. And then once they win the war, they then impose in the name of the people on the rest of the masses, their will. That is from, and we'll talk about, that's the, the pattern from the American revolution, 1776 to the French 1789 to all these other revolutions. They're just a bloody revolution, which then imposes its will on the masses and being justified by saying we the people but it, it's in reality it's just we some of the elites and some of the people some of the people we won the war we're going to impose our will that's the historical reality but we have an increasing amount of bloodshed so for example i mean the french revolution they draft them and then they commit genocide they're they're killing entire villages in the vendee in the name of liberty that's exactly what they're doing. In the name of liberty, they're committing genocide. So this is the power of rhetoric during this period. And what Cahill is talking about, the moneyed interest is able to produce the most amount of rhetoric for the most amount of people, creating the most amount of 
what Ed Bernays will call in 1947, engineered consent. So they're going to figure out really quickly, wow, we can really psychologically manipulate people and we can get them all into a big fervor and we can convince them to kill and die for us. That's pretty good. That, I mean, that's, that's a lot more power than the absolute monarchs had. I mean, they, they at least had to tell people that we're going to war. I mean, they, they didn't have all these fancy rhetoric, these things of liberty, equality, eternity, and all that stuff. They didn't have this record rhetoric to, to draw from and bring to the people. And so what, what you find here is that there's a strong, a very strong power of rhetoric that's discovered by the elites especially beginning with the American revolution. Now, what makes this so powerful is that there are real injustices happening. Remember, so we talked about, mentioned that the poor are suffering further because of all this, this corruption and the, you know, the absolute monarchs and, you know, monarchs just seizing lands that are for the poor. So there is an actual injustice happening to the poor. And so the poor can be whipped up into a fervor because they're actually suffering injustice. Another injustice is, that due to the influence of Protestantism and Jansenism, there was a strong emphasis on the bondage of the will in that man does not have his free will. And so there's a strong philo false philosophy that denied the freedom of man's will. And so there's also a reaction against that because that's a real injustice. That's a, it's an error. Obviously man is truly free. He has a free will. And then finally, there's the physical slavery. Now we talked about how back in 1435, Pope Eugene was already condemning the slave trade in the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. So the popes understood and Christians understood that slavery was wrong from the start. But there was so a great deal of corruption because slavery makes people rich. People were rich. They were, you know, and, and the popes waffled. Some popes even had slaves. The popes waffled on this issue. They weren't all pure, like purely condemning it from the very beginning. And like we um, uh, mentioned, the colonial powers, the elites among the colonial powers who, you know, among new Spain, you know, they're like these uh, full-blooded Spaniards who are racist. They think they're the, you know, the best, the cream of the crop. They're debating about whether or not they should enslave the Indians. Whereas the, the rest of Spain is intermarrying with all the Indians. So they're committing the, the, you know, Mexicans of today who are mestizos, they're all mixed blood, Spanish and Indian. And the Jesuits are all defending the Indians from slavery and working to help them out of starvation in, in the jungles and, you know, give them an economic well, well-being. But this battle between the Jesuits who are defending the Indians and the elites who are seeking to enslave them is eventually lost when Pope Clement XIV suppresses the Jesuits in 1773. So this real injustice of slavery is actually happening. And this doesn't really come into play until we talk about feminism, which gets thrown in with, with abolitionism. But there, the point is there, there are real injustices happening. And so the rhetoric hit, touches, a, touches a, a soft spot, touches a, a, a tender chord for these you know, people who are suffering real misery. So this is going to be an, an extremely important point that is going to lead to the secularization of Europe, as we'll see. So let's talk about a little bit more on the, the basics. We're going to back up. I'm going to talk about some more general things that are happening, and then we'll talk about some specific dates and talk about why those are important. So the biggest thing about this period is that the whole world had a massive industrial revolution. We can just say from 1776 to the present, it's a massive industrial revolution. We went from musket, muskets to machine guns. We went from you know paper to smartphones. It's a massive technological industrial revolution. And that is the thing above all other, I would, I would argue, even more than the politics, which has radically altered all the different social aspects of our world. So what I want to do is I want to go back to the true definition of man. And we're going to talk about how this affects this whole revolution. 
So the true definition of man is that he is ordered towards three things. He is ordered towards knowing the truth, doing the good, and making what is beautiful. So the true, the good, and the beautiful, that's what he's ordered towards. His intellect is ordered towards knowing the truth, his will towards doing the good, making the good. He's ordered ultimately towards God, who is the true, the good, the beautiful. And so from this, we can gather what is the true definition of wealth? What is the true definition? What is wealth? Well, in our modern day, we, we think of wealth solely as money. Well, that's incorrect. The true definition of wealth, here's, and this is, shout out to Lowell Forrester who really pointed this out and clarified this really well. Here's, here's my definition, true definition of wealth, free and secure access to the true, the good, and the beautiful, both in the natural and the supernatural orders. That's the definition of wealth. And what I mean by that is you do need natural prosperity. You need to have food, shelter, clothing, because you can't enjoy the higher goods without those. You know, St. Thomas even says this, if you're giving alms, you can't give these spiritual alms deeds of mercy and correcting the sinner to a man who's starving. You need to give him the, his corporal needs. So that's a very important thing. But the the supernatural order, the, the true, the good, and the beautiful, according to the supernatural order, are infinitely higher than that which is according to the natural order, as we should all know. But this is going to get confused. So then we're going to continue with this. So the true definition of wealth, keep that in mind. Now I want to, I want to introduce the, the term generativity. A generativity is a stabilizing process which unites generations in passing down a tradition. And this is what we, we talked about culture. And we'll t I'm, I'm going to define that in a moment. But generativity is present in every single civilization where you're passing down something. There is a tradition. Tradition means passing down. This is talked about in my book, Introduction to the Bible. Talk about that and how that's important to understand the Bible. But then a culture is a fecund generativity, which means it grows, which fro flows from the cultus. So the cultus, meaning the religious right, which then defines what is that true wealth. It defines the true good and the beautiful on both the supernatural and natural levels. So we have the true wealth, and then we have the generativity, which passes something down. And then the culture is what defines, using the cultus, it defines what is true, good, and beautiful. It all flows from this cultus, this religious right that is the that is the center of culture. And then the culture flows towards the whole society from the cultus. And this is true in every civilization, except ours, as we'll see. So it flows from the culture, and there are two basic aspects, elements of culture that you need. The two basic the two basic elements here are tradition and elders. So you need to have something passing down. So the tradition is everything that gets passed down. So some, some of it's written down and some of it's material things like architecture, music, uh, and then some of it's totally oral. Some of it's just totally custom. So the, the, the courtship rights, the, the way that one does courtship, fashions, different things of that nature. Now they, they may not even be written down, but they're just, they're just passed down from next generation. So that, and then the, the other aspect of that is that there is the elders, the, the people in the culture itself who are designated as the guardians of tradition. They pass down that tradition to the next generation. And generativity is what keeps that process going so that there's a unity and a stability between these generations. And a culture is what makes that fecund. It grows, it, it gives birth to greater things. And so the, we see Christendom is the only true culture because it is the only one that true that gives birth, like we talked about using logos, gives birth to science, has this true science. So what we have with Luther, we have, he, ch he makes a fundamental change to culture. What he does is he takes, we have the elders and we have the tradition. He takes the elders away. 
He removes them. He makes himself the elder. And then he cuts down all the tradition into the Bible alone. And he has some tradition of his, his own that he writes. And this is what radically alters. This is what introduces what I call anti-culture because it's no longer culture at this point because we've removed the basic elements of what culture is. And so now we have a principle of revolution coming. And this is what begins in 1517 to really bubble to the surface, to continue, to go on, to cause this massive revolution through all the, the fundamental culture of Christendom that is embedded deeply into the hearts and minds and souls of all of these Christians, it takes hundred, uh, hundreds of years for this process of anti-culture to continue to degrade the fundamental culture as it is. And it was not enough to completely destroy it. In fact, it's taken, we're going to talk about it, it's taken about 500 years to really destroy it because it was so strong. So it took so long of this anti-culture working within it as, as, as a virus, as a disease to destroy the body Christendom of culture, culture of Christendom. So the, let me see, send me some comments. If the, if the, uh, if the stream is not going through, let me know. Uh, just want to make sure that goes through. So, what we have is Our Lady of La Salette says that there will be a total corruption of customs in the 20th century. And we'll see how that, that happens in just a moment. But finally, I want to, in this whole cultural framework, we want to discuss how the family is the central piece of this whole culture, because that is where the fundamental person, the eldership is, is uh, manifested because it's the parents, obviously, particularly the father and the mother, which are passing down that tradition to the children. And so the family is what is that microcosm of culture. So it is the microcosm of culture. So the family is this central unit that is absolutely fundamental to the whole society is the family. And that is what that the family is what who goes to the cultus and participates in the cultus and from the cultus gets the tradition and the the all of the what it, the definition of true wealth the true the good and the beautiful all of these great things and then the father passes it down to the son and the son grows up through the process of generativity he also embraces the true the good and the beautiful then he passes it to his son etc cetera, etc cetera. and you have a stable process of culture now one quick point is this is what makes the difference between Christian culture and Mohammedan culture. And the Mohammedan culture is so pernicious because it is a culture, not like, not like Protestantism. Protestantism is an anti-culture, but Mohammedanism is a culture. They have a tradition. They pass it down. They have a stable civilization, but it's not fecund. It does not give birth to more good, true, good, and beautiful. It does not create science like logos does in the christian civilization and that's the difference but it's so powerful because it truly is a culture so this is this is what makes it incredibly difficult uh to overcome so so up to the now up to the point of 1776 even though there was this nominalist tyranny and there was this anti-culture working because of Christianity, because there was a cultus, there was still that central cultus. There was still culture. There was still Christian culture. And even among the Protestants, there was still a Christian culture, even though there was a principle that was at work that was anti-culture. But what happens with 1776 and following is that, that principle of revolution becomes full blown and it becomes anti Christ. It becomes secular for the first time. Before this, it would still, it still had the cultus. And so the ruler still had his cultus. He still had a coronation mass. He still had to pay homage to the vine in order to legitimize his rule. So there was a cultus which formed the culture. But what happens in 1776 is you have the first country which removes the cultus towards the divine 
and puts in its place a cultus towards man. And this is what makes the difference is that in the American revolution is created a cultus towards man. And so this is what cures. This is what goes into the difficulty of this whole process. So we're going to go through some, um, we're going to talk about how the, a secular cultus, a cultus of man transforms everything. So the first of all, the political. So obviously the the tyranny was all the way up to 1776. There was this tyranny, but then we have this might makes right. We have the the populace deciding what's right solely in the face of their of their will. The the popular will might makes right. And so that's what makes the tyranny of this of this voluntarism, this popular mob rule. And then the poverty then provokes reactions. So we'll talk about some of those reactions in communism and, and some other things and feminism. And then the most important in my mind is the economic difference. So what happened with the true wealth, the access to the true, the good and the beautiful. So the Christian era up to 1776, obviously these are all generalities. There's, you know, uh, you know, counter examples to all these things, but um, these are the general truths of, of history the the christian era contained free and secure access to the true the good and the beautiful according to the supernatural order and there was a, a great deal of material poverty so a medieval peasant had he had secure access to the true the good and beautiful but he had to worry about vikings invading he had to worry about plague killing him at 30 years old there was not a lot of medical expertise at that time you know, they were believing in humors and bloodletting and stuff like that. So there was ser serious material poverty, but he had a great deal of more wealth because he had access to the true, the good and the beautiful of the higher order of the supernatural order. Now, what happens during this period is it gets flipped is that what happens now is that there's such a strong emphasis on the material wealth, the wealth, according to the natural order that the higher wealth is cast aside. And so people talk all about how the, all these revolutions and we have all this technology, you know, we have indoor plumbing and all this great stuff, but we're actually in, in greater poverty than our fathers were because of the definition of true wealth. And this is because of the cultural revolution, which loses the cultus and creates in its stead a cult, cult as a man. So the economic change is a shift in the definition of man. It's a shift in economy for the sake of man tor towards man for the sake of the economy. Man is, is now seeking to create more wealth so that people can become richer. And they think that being rich materially is going to make man greater. But that it's the opposite. It's the opposite. The, the, the true wealth is really in, in the supernatural order. But there's a strong shift that happens where the economy gets reorganized. Now, the 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 main shift, E. Michael Jones points this out, is is when he when you when you take e economics out of the moral theology, they, they take it out of moral theology and put it into sort of physics. Sort of like a, they, they think that it'll just bounce around and create a bunch of wealth. So, so here's a quote from 1846, Richard Cobden in Manchester. He says this, quote, I see in the free trade principle that which shall on, act on the moral world as the principle of gravitation in the universe, drawing men together, thrusting aside the antagonism of race, and creed and language and uniting us in the bonds of eternal peace, end quote. So you see them understanding this economy. It's like, if we just set up the system like this, everything will just work out. We'll just be united in the bonds of eternal peace. Won't that be great? Well, they didn't count on original sin, but we'll get to that. But this is, this is what gets pushed by the elites to completely revolutionize industry and agriculture and economy. So what happens is 
through from 1776 to 1900, a great deal, a great majority of the population gets moved from the rural to their, it's urbanization. Everybody moves to the cities and they, they start working in these factories. So the, the entire, this whole industrial revolution, everybody grew materially richer for the, at the expense of the true wealth at the expense of culture. And we're going to get into how that happens because the, the main, the most crucial point here is that the family gets split up. The family is that epicenter of culture, the father, ma the mother, and the children. Now, a crucial point here is that everybody works on the family farm. Everybody, they're either a farmer and everybody works on the family farm. That's mom, dad, and children. Or, you know, there's different craftsmen and merchants and traders or whatever like that. But most of those people are in the town. And so you're, you're still together as a family. You're not far away. You're not split up. Everybody's together. So what industrial revolutions did was it split up the family. So now the man is far away from his family most of the day. And then he gets money to spend on his own. And so he gets into alcohol. This is the beginning of the temperance movement at the end of the 19th century. The woman is also completely more and more, more than ever before. She's completely dependent on her husband because she no longer works as a part of the, the family economy because the family economy, the woman was doing all sorts of important tasks, whether that's just dexterous tasks or just taking care of the home or all sorts of different things. But the industrial revolution minimizes the, the woman's role in the family economy. And then the children are no, either they're either forced into factories at a very young age, or later on, you have the invention of the teenager. Before this, teenagers didn't exist. They got invented during this time period and then later in the 1900s. Before this, there was just boys and men or girls and women. There was, there was no teenager period. Obviously, there's adolescence, but adolescence was just a sort of being a young man or a young woman. There was not a, an idea of teenagers because the Industrial Revolution created these teenagers who had nothing to do because they weren't working on the family farm anymore. And I'm not idealizing farm life. I'm just saying that the family was more unified. There was a, a family culture, but this all gets shattered by all these industrial revolutions. And so there's the invention of the teenager. The teenager then can be manipulated by the marketing. So that's when we talked about the rhetoric. We'll get into the, the dates here in just a minute. But we also have the invention of pornography with the French Revolution. The French Revolution, 1789, uh, the Marquis de Sade. Again, shout out to Eva Michael Jones, Libido Dominandi. He points this out, how they began using pornography for political control very early. This was the beginning of pornography in this French Revolution. In fact, it was this industry which was driving a lot of the technological advances because initially they couldn't show pornography except, you know, in a theater hall and that type of thing or mass produce it using in books and whatnot, but they were limited. And so they were actually funding these different efforts to create more technology. I know the smartphone in particular funded by the porn industry for obvious reasons. That's going to multiply your profits right away. So that's what you have. Those are some of the aspects of this. Um, and we'll get into, it, it also gets into the arts, music and movies. Um, but let's, let's get through, through some of these dates. Let me see where my time is. 40 minutes. Okay. I'll try it. Okay. We're doing, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> we're actually get through this. Hopefully I take some questions in about 20 minutes. Um, okay. So 1745 is the first big encyclical. It's an encyclical. It's just the Italian bishops, but it's uh, Benedict the 14th, 1745, Vix Prevenit. That is an encyclical against usury. And the basic principle is, and, and this is sort of, this is bigger than usury, but the big, the biggest principle of this, this whole liberalism of the free trade is that, and this is what I've discussed in uh, some previous videos on poverty and alms deeds, is that the church understood that exponential accumulation of wealth could not be justified because 
it must because it belongs to the poor. Your excess wealth belongs to the poor. And so you cannot exponentially accumulate wealth forever and just become wealthy forever. Your excess wealth belongs to the poor. And that that's that was that's the 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 greater principle of distributive justice, which the church understood, which was created in the, and that culture in the Christian culture, but with the breakdown of culture, the breakdown of these morals, this idea that these exponential accumulation of wealth is wrong per se gets lost. And so Vix Pernay for Vainet 1745 is an example of shooting at this accumulation of wealth in usury and trade generally was looked down upon because in in terms of just trading shares and just making money off of shares because you're not actually contributing to the economy and you're not actually making something you're not actually laboring to do something you're just sort of playing the shots and moving your money around and getting rich off of that you know so you're not actually helping anybody but yourself so it's not really an equal exchange between you and the common good so anyhow this is 1745 so 1776 the american revolution so this is where the it shows the entire world that the elites can impose their pose their will on the masses by the means of psychological manipulation. Now, Amer the American Revolution was a soft secularism. They tolerated Catholics. They worked with Catholics. It divided Catholics at the time. In fact, the Bishop of Quebec um, excommunicated John Carroll, who was the, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, the Jesuit priest. And it divided Catholics at the time. So there were, and there are certain elements of the American Republic which are good. And this this is this is very important. We need to, it, you know, we'll, we'll we'll concede those things. But the the historical facts are also that the so-called patriots, basically the the American colonies were divided into three groups. It was about roughly one third were patriots who wanted to revolt, one third were loyalists who wanted to stay with Britain. And they were fighting each other, the patrons of the loyalists. And then there was another third who were just, you know, frontiersmen and farmers. Or whatever. They didn't care. They didn't want to become involved. So they did not fight. And then the Indians and the Africans, uh, they chose both sides, depending on their opportunity and what would serve their interests. So it's not true when they go to write the Constitution, they say, we the people. Well, what they mean is we the one third of the colonists. That's the reality. You know, I mean, they could just admit that and say, hey, OK, well, we one third of the of the colonists. Now, what's interesting, though, is that the you know, many of the patriots were businessmen who were threatened by the business interests in their business interests from the taxation, obviously. And so they were working against that. But they used this rhetoric to whip up the popular masses to cause a revolt, bloody revolution. And so what's interesting is, is when this kind of gets unmasked is immediately following this revolution, there's the Shays Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion, which are some of these are actually revolutionary veterans who are rebelling against the newly formed American Republic on the exact same principles that the patriots themselves rebelled against Britain. No taxation without representation. So what happened was, because the reason there was these taxations is because Britain had just fought a war against France, the Seven White Years War. They imposed the taxation. The, the patriot businessmen that was not working with their business interests, they, they whipped up a revolution. They won the war with the help of France. And then, well, now we got to impose some taxation. So they imposed taxation just like the British did. And then what happened? There was another revolution. But what happened then? They put that revolution down. Shays Revolution, Shays Rebellion, Wixie Rebellion. They put it down because this is the reality of things. This is what we're talking about. This is that nominalism. It's might makes right. It's not a matter of principles. It's it, the principles, these rhetoric, that's just a large degree for the masses to just whip up support for or, you know a popular revolution. So... That comes to the fore with the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson helps the French compose their Declaration of the Rights of Man. The French Revolution happened in 1789. And that is hard secularism because the Americans actually tolerated the Catholics. They tolerated state churches in the, in the, on the state level. They had The federal government had no cultus. It was totally secular. 
but they allowed these individual culti to exist on, in the colonies. Whereas in the French Revolution, like we said, they were committing this genocide against the, the Catholic Church. And so they were going after the Catholic Church. They were going after the Catholics. And so they, they were absolutely against it. So 1789, and then you have a, another copycat revolution that is supported by the French in Ireland, 1798. Now that's supported, but it doesn't get very far. It gets crushed by the British crown. But what you have here is the escalating bloodshed, escalating, escalating technology and militarization. And this is going to continue to escalate during the 1900s. Now, What's interesting here is that the papacy vacillates between conciliating with the Republican revolutionaries and being very strict against them. So first you have Pius VI. Pius VI completely condemns the French Revolution. He gets captured by Napoleon. He, he dies in France. Pius VII initially is conciliatory with Napoleon. It's a great story. If you look at the, read the link that I, on the show notes, the modern Catholic liberal disaster, I go through some of the story of this. And Pius VII, he's a servant of God. He eventually conquers Napoleon. He's, he, he excommunicates him. He forces him eventually to, uh, to take the last rites as a Catholic and die a Catholic so, um, while he's in exile. But Napoleon spreads his empire throughout Europe and is finally stopped by a coalition of, of European powers, but through the process, he also spreads these revolutionary ideas further. He's able to attack the church as he goes through. Meanwhile, Gregory, the later on, uh, not meanwhile, but in a few decades. So continuing on 1836, Gregory, the seven, uh, Gregory, the, um, Gregory, the 16th, sorry, Gregory, the 16th applies Vix per invanit to the whole church. So he takes that encyclical against Eurizuri applies to the whole church. He condemns the French liberals. And then we have Pius the ninth. He also begins as a conciliatory figure. He can begins to conciliate with the revolutionaries in 1846. He liberalizes the papal States. He creates more democratic institutions. He's trying to work with them. He takes some exiles, brings them back to the papal, papal States. He thinks that he, maybe he can talk it through with them, but then they murder his own associate. So he flees Rome. He comes back with an army, takes back his sea, and now he takes off the gloves. He understands the true nature of this revolutionary force, that they won't stop at anything until they've completely destroyed social order itself, because that's what they're really after. Now, we're going to talk about here, let me pause. This is what Pius the, the Ninth began to understand and many of the, the many of the popes understand at this time that there are these internal enemies so in 1848 is the fateful year of revolution now republican revolution sweeps europe in this year but there are also two very important movements that begin to bring get a great deal of steam there is feminism 1848 the Seneca Falls Convention in America. And this is where the feminists take the revolutionary doctrine of Thomas Jefferson and they go, they apply that to the family. They say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and that women should now rebel against their husbands, just like the revolutionaries rebelled against the British crown, using the same principles or rhetoric to whip up the support. Now here's where the feminists, so the, the feminists at this time, they were also abolitionists. So like we talked about, they're actually fighting against a real injustice. They're you know, dealing with in the enslavement of Africans and they're mixing that in with these false philosophies of revolution against every hierarchy whatsoever. And so 1848, we have feminism. 1848 also, Karl Marx writes the Communist Manifesto. So you have the real injustice of the poor. You have a Karl Marx who is trying to whip up the poor's hatred of injustice, which is good, 
but their envy of the rich, which is evil. It's trying to whip up the poor into this communist revolution. Now, here we talk about the church's internal en enemies. Now, this is where we talk about the Jewish revolutionary spirit. Now, the Jewish revolutionary spirit refers to, this is a, the term, again, from E. Michael Jones, which refers to the leadership of Jews in revolutionary anti-culture, anti-logos movements from the very beginning. Now, this becomes this begins to be extremely potent at this time. This is when it's really unleashed. Now, Jewish revolutionary spirit is related to masonry. It's related to, related to communism as well. Now, when we say that about Jews, we're not saying all Jews are revolutionaries per se. We're not saying, like we're saying, we're not saying all Mohammedans are jihadis. You know, we're, we're making a general statement about a general cultural or social push from coming from many Jews. Now, to give you an example of this, what you all you need to do is quote Jews themselves about what Jews say about themselves. So this is from um, this is from Lambert in uh, Jer Dirty Jews and Christian Right from Ha Aretz, March second, two thousand fourteen. They say he says among this is later on in the in the later ninth twentieth uh, century, but he says that American Jews are challenging America's power powerful religious family friendly cultural and asserting their Jewishness by glorifying obscenity. Again, we have Nathan Abrams, Abrams, Jewish historian, writes in Triple X Thins, Jewish Quarterly 2004, he says, quote, Jewish involvement in porn is actually the result of an atavistic hatred of Christian authority. They are trying to weaken the dominant of culture in America by moral subversion, end quote. So these are Jews talking about their fellow Jews and what they believe their fellow Jews are trying to accomplish, which is the spirit of Antichrist. So we're not we're not hating on Jews. We're not trying to be anti-Semitic. We're just simply okay. I'm, we're taking the Jews at their, you know, their face, their face value, their their statements, and we're saying okay, yes, there are certain Jews that are a part of these different movements, and they're identifying their own Jewishness with these anti-Christian movements, and so. That is what we mean by the Jewish revolutionary spirit. We're not saying all Jews are bad. We're saying that there are these leader Jews who are leading these anti-Christian movements. So they're connected with masonry. They're connected with communism. So you have these internal forces, which are, and connected with feminism, which are playing on the already anti-culture movement of Protestantism to try to push it to its logical end, which is the overthrow of all Christian order. Now, 1854... Pius the Ninth, Pius the Ninth issues the Immaculate Conception. And what he points out here is that not only is Our Lady free of original sin, but everybody else does have original sin. Because like we talked about, we, we quoted Richard Cobden and he said, well, if we just have the free trade, just go just bounce around like atoms, like the forces of gravity, we're going to be united in the bonds of eternal peace. Well, that's not going to happen because everybody has original sin. No matter how perfect a system you create, as if you're not dealing with original sin, you're not going to create true wealth. And you're not even going to create material wealth because you're going to create a system where you can have the accumulation of wealth exponentially without the associated distributive justice. Now, again, like I said, the Industrial Revolution created a great deal of material wealth, but it was at the expense of culture. So that is the central error, which is going to be picked up by Teilhard de Chardin in just a, just a few minutes. We'll talk about that. I'm going to try to wrap up the next 10, 15 minutes. So the so 1867, the Syllabus of Error. Syllabus of Errors, Pius IX condemns various social and political errors. Then Vatican I is what goes against the growing nationalism first of all the many the great deal of number of the bishops who came to Vatican 1 were govern basically government appointed employees they were just like government employees so the the universal jurisdiction of the pope is against this nationalism it's saying that the pope not the king not the republican government is the you has the universal jurisdiction over every Christian. And so it's against this growing nationalism. 
And it's also against the rationalism of the philosophy at the day. And obviously there's doctrinal things, but we're not really focusing on that. But the Italian army comes in and stops Vatican I. They are, this is the, what's called the Ninth Crusade where uh, Catholics across the world, uh, including many Irish, again, shout out to the Irish. Uh, they had come to Rome to fight all these revolutionary forces who were bearing down on Rome. They want to take Rome. They finally took Rome. They stopped Vatican I. And this is the beginning of the papacy in exile. Now, this is also the second industrial revolution. So there's more and more industrial revolutions happening. Now, the British Navy, once again, British Navy is dominating the whole world, British Empire. And it's because of the Navy. They've got this Navy. They can dominate the seas. They can dominate the econ econ uh, economics. But what happens is during this period is that Germany is trying to rival Britain. So they're trying to also build a navy and britain is saying no let's stop let's not do <laughs> let's uh why don't you stop your navy why don't we have a truce and germany say no we want a navy because you've got a navy and so this is when britain starts talking about we need to provoke a war with germany because germany is getting way too powerful so this is when they begin to start to talk about let's have a war with germany this will be eventually become world war one but a crucial thing happens, and that's when the British Navy switches from using coal to using oil. And this is the connection with the Middle East. This is when, and around this time, when they begin to fund Wahhabism and the Kingdom of Saud. So this is the beginning of, later, this is going to become very big in the 20th century. So this oil is going to run this whole military industrial complex. So meanwhile, 1870 to 1914, which is when World War I breaks out, the papacy works to, again, fighting against all these enemies, fighting against all the poverty. This is Rerum Novarum, 1891. Leo XIII works against communism and works against the uh, excesses, excesses of capitalism. Because capitalism and communism are not equally bad. There are excesses of common, uh, capitalism, but it's it's not as if they're an equally bad thing. The Only the excesses of capitalism are bad. Uh, capitalism itself, just a free market, free market in and of itself is fine. But it's when the free market becomes completely without moral any moral restraint, and it's just completely free, that's when it starts to become a problem. And that's when you have... During this time period, there's a massive labor movement, which is where all these laborers are rebelling against these harsh factory conditions. So all these, this is when the, all these, the families are getting broken up. The men are drinking. The, we have the temperance movement coming in, in America. And there is this strong industrialization and a massive labor movement. There's a massive, massive amounts of violence. There's, there's people are being killed. There's riots because of the exploitation of workers. And that's what gets them so susceptible to communism because communism says, hey, your anger is real. Here's an AK-47. You know, I didn't have it but at that time, but here's a weapon. Here, here's your anger. Take it out on those rich people. And that's, that's you know, this is the communism. You know, this is what makes, makes these workers unite in this communist revolution, you know? And so the, the church was trying to work on this, but the problem with this century was that the church was trying to restore order and all of the people were being thrown into the cities so quickly that they were so quickly taken up by all these communist propaganda and the church was not helping them quick enough. And so they turned to the communists and this was the, by 1900, this was the, the strongest secularization of Europe. This is from a book called, by Owen Chad, Chadwick on the secularization of Europe. He argues that basically because the church was attempting to restore order, which was good, but the problem was that that former order, which was re represented in the former monarchies, what were themselves tyrants, and there was all sorts of social problems there, but in the, in the increased and rapid urbanization, the people, the masses were taken up by so many, uh, so much of this communist propaganda that the church could not keep up. They were not keeping up fast enough, but this is the, the split up of the family. Now, an important point about this is that when you separate husband and wife for more and more, just physically, 
the marriage bond begins to weaken. This is when a lot more people are writing about marriage and defining it as purely a romantic feeling. This is really the, the stronger birth of reducing marriage to solely about your feelings. And this is because of this industrial revolution. This is the argument of, oh, I don't have the book. Never mind, I don't have the book on the shelf, but it's uh, David Popinoy on Families Without Fathers. And he talks about how this massive social change, so it, it changed the, it separated mother and father, and it, and it started to really reduce the marriage bond to solely a romantic feeling. There's also the romantic movement and all sorts of things, other factors that we can't get into. But so Pius X, now actually notably, Leo the 13th in uh, 1891, he actually tries to conciliate again with the third French Republic. So another secular Republic, we don't have time to go into all the complex history of France during this time, but again, like Pius the seventh, Leo the 13th tries to conciliate and work with the secular Republicans. And that this is actually what divides French Catholics at this time. And France goes back and forth and the papacy goes back and forth during this period. So Pius X reverses Leo XIII's decision. He, because France becomes more and more anti-clerical, he suppresses the Catholic uh, Republican groups. And then all that he can do cannot stop the growing war. The alliances had continued to being built. So there was alliances with the German, with Germany. There was alliances with Britain. They were all allying with one another. They had these worldwide colonial empires. And finally, there was a breakup with the Habsburgs and, and Serbia. There was an outbreak of war. They, uh, Serbia and uh, Habsburg were at war. Russia was pulled in. Germany was pulled in. Britain was pulled in. They were trying to provoke a war with Germany. So they were happy. So World War One happens, 1914. Now, during World War One, there's a young priest by the name of Teilhard de Chardin, and he has some kind of great vision during this war that things are going to be great, and there's some kind of great Hegelian evolution towards the Omega point, and he begins to work on his ideas during this time in World War One, and this his ideas that there is a there's a, an evolution towards something greater that everything's going to work out for the best. It's remarkable that he somehow came up with this during World War I. We're in, during a, the worldwide bloodbath of destruction that World War I was. But somehow he does. And Teilhard de Chardin comes up with his ideas. He begins to spread them in the decades following. And his ideas are competing for the hearts of the Catholic faithful with the other event of World War I, which is our Lady Fatima. And Our Lady Fatima's message is that things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. All men must repent or God will punish the world with another world war. So she gives, as you all know, the consecration of Russia, the first Saturdays, daily rosary for men to repent. And in particular, in my opinion, I think that there is such a great emphasis that God is giving us on the Virgin Mary and it's because of feminism, because feminism destroys femininity. And so there's an exaltation of the mother of God during this time period. And that's why we're making reparation during the five Saturdays to the mother of God, because feminism is an attack on the mother of God. It's an attack on her femininity. That's why, in, in my, this is just my opinion, I think that's why, in particular, that's why it's so crucial, because Our Lady reestablishing true femininity reestablishes the family because the woman is the heart of the home. And until the woman loves her own femininity and has the, the femininity of our lady, that's when a home can really happen. That's when a family can really be restored. And obviously, you know, manhood, we go, we talk all about that on this channel, you know, um, you should know, but so what happens? Um, so these two visions of the, of the world, Okay, we'll do like 10, 10 more minutes, I think. Um, these two visions of the world are competing. Tailhardianism, which is everything's doing great. We're doing wonderful. We've got all this technology. And oh, Lady Fatima is just penance, penance, penance. Those are the two visions competing. Now, then you have 1918, the Treaty of Versailles. Versailles punishes the Germans. 
In fact, the British Navy sets up a blockade, which starts to starve tens of thousands of men, women, and children in Germany during this time. So Germany is starving. And they're punished by the Allies into signing this Treaty of Versailles, which is a terrible treaty. It hurts them, but they're, they're stuck. They have to sign it. Then there's the Weimar Republic period. This is the period between 1918 and 1939. And this is the time when Germany becomes radicalized and eventually Adolf Hitler gets power. But many historians, and I agree with this, I think that World War I and II should be understood as one war with a truce in, in, in the middle. Because it's the same war, it's the same powers, the same economies fighting against each other, and Germany is punished, and they get radicalized because of it. And I'm certainly not excusing any of that. I'm saying that these are cause and effects. When when someone suffers an injustice, that's a seedbed for radicalism. And Adolf Hitler is this awful satanic tyrant who is able to convince all these Germans to go along with them because they're suffering real injustice. It's the same cycle like the communists did. The communists were able to whip up whip up the injustice of the poor because they had this rhetoric because they were suffering real injustice. So in the in the in the interregnum period, you have the solid uh, so Dalitium Pianum, which is run by Benigni, who is a monarchist who's trying to suppress all these all these uh, Republican fervor in the 1918. Now by the way, once again, 1918 is the, the end of the Ottoman Empire. They lose the war. They're, 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 they lose, they completely secularize 1924. They suppress the caliph. And as well as the end of all monarchy. That's the end of monarchy is the end of World War I. So then you have the 1920s. So 1920s goes back and forth. You have Action Francais, which is suppressed by, which is a monarchist uh, organization in France largely monarchist, which is suppressed by Pius XI. Now, this is causes a split between the two largest or one of the two largest influential Catholic minds of that period, and that's Gary Goulagin, Gergange, and Jacques Maritain. These two men were both Thomas, and they both had, but they both had very different visions of the world, the po politically and socially. Maritain, as we'll see, he begins to believe in America, and this is what really gives us Vatican II to a large degree. Lagrange does not believe in that, and he supports the, the social order as it was before. So, but the 1920s happen, and especially in America, you have what's known as the jazz era. You have the roaring 20s, as we call them here. And this is a period when, this is when the Jewish revolutionary spirit begins to really come to the fore because Hollywood begins to make pornography. They were making basically what we would call R-rated movies. They were showing them in the theory, theater, and this shocks the conscience of the Americans, Protestant and Catholic alike. The Protestants try to try to get after it and stop it. They are they're unsuccessful, and so the Catholics, in a amazing, uh, an incredible manifestation of their unity, their cultural unity through the cultists. They organize a national boycott of Hollywood, which forces Hollywood to begin to follow what's called the Hayes Code, which is following decency in movies against there's obscenity laws. Like we that quote about obscenity, that was a later quote that'll, that'll come on later. But there are these laws of obscenity, laws against obscenity. So they, the, the Hayes Code included no blasphemy, no nudity, no glorification of evil in the sense that you are making evil into as as you as as many movies are today, it's just pure glorification of what is evil. So it's not it's okay to show evil, but it's different. There's a different aspect of that. So the the point is here we we have this massive social force that the Catholic Church exerts in America, and this spreads into other countries through what's called a legion of decency. And this is a, a pact of Catholics, which is very, this is pretty much, I mean, in my opinion, this is Catholic church at its height during this whole period, during this, this time is when they were banded together, the legion of decency. This was praised by multiple popes and they were forcing Hollywood to make 
films which were not blasphemous and not obscene. And lest anyone think that this hampered on their artistic quality, these are the years of some of the greatest films of all time. For example, Citizen Kane, still one of still understood to be one of the greatest films of all time, was during this period. So this is these are the code era. This is the code era. Now, Maritain comes to the United States 1933. So he begins to believe that United States is the last hope for the world. He believes that this country is really the model for post Christendom world. And he writes in three years later, 1936 integral humanism. And this is his book that is all about trying to imagine a secular world where the Christians are in exile where they are trying to work together with Protestants or, you know, what have you for some kind of social order that has been lost. So the, now this integral humanism is read by a priest by the name of Montini, later Paul VI. Paul VI, uh, Montini is so enamored with integral humanism that he translates it into Italian. He loves it. He thinks this is the greatest thing ever. This is enamors him to such a degree that the entire Vatican II is really Malitan. He Paul VI wanted to dedicate Vatican II to Malitan. And this is integral humanism. That is his idea. So that split between Malitan and Lagrange ends up in Malitan's favor. And it turns out with the two competing visions of the world... Fatima or Teilhardianism, Teilhardianism is the one who wins out because Maritain's vision of the world fits in with that vision. Everything's going greater. It's, you know, Maritain has a, so much optimism about America. He makes these predictions that, you know, Americans are going to be this great power and all this, you know, whatnot. But as we'll see, America begins to become the exporter of pornography. In just a few short years. So then you have World War II. Men fail to repent. Now, 1950. I'm just passing over these things. I'm sorry. We don't have time to get all this stuff. Pius XII, again, he also commends Christian democracy in this in a similar way that Leo XIII did. In 1950, he gives a speech at the uh, at the canonization of uh, Golgani Moretti. I, I don't remember. I think I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry. But he gives a speech of this canonization. He says that there's been a conspiracy over the last 50 years. So he's talking 1900 to 1950. There's been a conspiracy against chastity. So Pius XII already understands 1950 that they've been trying to overturn these morals specifically against chastity for 50 years. Again, in 1960, Ottaviani in some of the early pre Vatican II documents, the, the, the schema, he talks about that there's been a great deal of effort against chastity in fashions, in, in movies, and all this stuff. So there's all this, this intense pressure that people are recognizing, and it just so happens that these people are also aligned with Fatima because they see what's happening. Fatima says that the man is degrading. They even talk about, she even talks about fat, uh, fashions. They see that things are degrading, that men must repent. And so that's the message that they want to present to the world of Vatican II. But what happens is Paul VI tips the balance. He sides in favor of Malitan. He chooses Teilhardianism. And that is Vatican II. They ignore the warnings of these churchmen against these dark forces. They say, no, even in God of Space, they say, quote, the church has nothing to fear from the modern world, end quote. And they cast in their lot with the secular international revolution. Paul VI takes off his tiara. He goes to the United Nations. He says he gives it the more solemn, quote, solemn moral ratification of this lofty institution. He, he says, quote, he is convinced that this organization represents the obligatory path of modern civilization and world peace, end quote, 1965. Well, in that same year, that was the breaking of the production code, the beginning of mass-produced pornography, because the 
Jews and other forces were working to undermine this code, to undermine the social fabric of America and, and the world, especially with Sweden, to undermine this code and to impose pornography because they knew long ago that pornography, sexual revolution is, is political control. So it gets unleashed in the 60s. You have 1968 is the so-called sexual revolution. And it takes just a few short years for the Supreme Court of the United States and other nations follow and before and after. 1973 is Roe versus Wade, the legalization of abortion. Also in that same year, more marriages in America ended in divorce than in death. So you have the weakening of that marriage bond, which began decades earlier with the Industrial Revolution. And then pornography begins to be more and more in the movies. Uh, the music is following after what we've, we've talked about on this channel before. It follows after in the jazz era. It, it follows after the voodoo patterns of the backbeat using this unnatural rhythm to whip up uh, the concupiscible appetite, which is against chastity. And so the, the music is associated and used to push forward this agenda. And in 1973, Dietrich von Hildebrand writes The Devastated Vineyard. And the writing's on the wall at this point. It's just it's a complete devastation, a devastation of the social fabric and this is what brings us to today is that unleashing those forces is what brings us to this time period where you, we have pornography on demand. You have, as the popes even predicted earlier, women are completely degraded as object. They are in, in every, every sort of way, femininity as such is degraded, which is an indirect attack on the Virgin Mary. And here we are today. And now I want to bring it back, though, to the Mohammedans, because here's what Hilaire Belloc says in the Crusades, the very end. And this is written in 1937. This is where Hilaire Belloc predicts what we're seeing now, which is the resurgence of Mohammedanism. It's been laying dormant for a few centuries because of the dominance of the European civilization, but he goes into what we talked about on how the Euro European civilization, even though it's even though it's at its worst, it's still the greatest civilization because it still has logos. But the Mohammedans, because they have the culture, they have the religion, which Europe and Euro America is more and more losing. You have this. Conflict. So here's what he says, page 248. In the major thing of all, religion, we have fallen back. We, Europe, has fallen back, and Islam has in the main reserved, preserved its soul. Modern Europe, and particularly Western Europe, has progressively lost its religion, and especially that united religious doctrine permeating the whole community, which unity gives spiritual strength to that community. He's talking about culture. There is with us a complete chaos in religious doctrine, where religious doctrine is still held, and even in that part of the European population where the united doctrine and definition of Catholicism survives, it survives as something to which the individual is attached rather than the community. In other words, there's no culture. As nations, we worship ourselves. We worship the nation, or we worship, some few of us, a particular economic arrangement believed to be the satisfaction of social justice. In other words, our, it's a cultus of man. Those who direct us and from whom the tone of our policy is taken have no major spiritual interest. Their major personal interest is private gain, and this mood is reflected in the outer forms of government by the establishment of plutocracy. And that's what we have. We have plutocracy. The, the rich or the elites are the ones who are running things. It's not just merely popular will. Islam has not suffered this spiritual decline. And in the contrast between our religious chaos and the religious certitudes still strong throughout the Mohammedan world lies our peril. We have returned to the Levant, meaning the European powers were at that time occupying the Middle East. We have returned apparently more as masters than ever we were during the struggle of the Crusades, but we have returned bankrupt in that spiritual wealth, which was the glory of the Crusades. 
We are divided in the face of a Mohammedan world, divided in every way, divided by separate independent national rivalries, by warring interests of possessors and dispossessed, and that division cannot be remedied because the cement which once held our civilization together, the Christian cement, has crumbled. These lines were written in the month of January 1937. Perhaps before they appear in print, the rapidly developing situation in the Near East will be have marked some notable change. Perhaps that change will be deferred, but change there will be, continuous and great. Nor does it seem probable that at the end of such a change, especially if the process has belonged, Islam will be the loser. That's the end of the book. So he's predicting in 1937 what we're seeing today, which is the resurgence of Mohammedanism as a cultural force against Christendom. Because now, especially in many parts of Europe, there has been a complete surrender to the Masonic communist Jewish revolutionary spirit. And now there is a, an, a, a firm alliance in the social realm against Christendom because both of them have the same spirit, which is the spirit of the Antichrist. They both deny Jesus Christ as the son of God, which is, as St. John says, the spirit of the Antichrist. That We're not talking about the final Antichrist, the end of time. We're just talking about basic spirit of Antichrist. So you have in these forces, they have joined forces now to war against Christendom. And what you have in the Europeans in internal enemies, you have Ripperger distinguishes between Luciferianism and Satanism. Luciferianism is just the worship of self. That's what that is. And Satanism is actually explicit worship of Satan. And that's what I see culminating of Mahomedanism is a Satanism, which is just worshiping the spirit of Antichrist, whereas the Masonic Jewish revolutionary spirit communism society that we have turns into a Luciferianism, which is just worshiping man. Either way, the devil's happy. Whichever way we go. But as long as it's not Jesus Christ, everything is against Jesus Christ. They'll take the demons will take anything but Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. That's why the demons will take anything but Jesus. So that is the end. Anybody have any comments or questions? We could talk about them. I wanted to thank all of my patrons of the Apostolate. Your support helps us continue to produce these videos. Uh, we're continuing to produce books. We've got uh, Introduction to the Catholic Bible. That's uh, free for patrons, as well as Kennedy's book, Terror of Demons, Reclaiming Traditional Catholic Masculinity. And we're going to talk about Mary and Manhood tomorrow night. That is going to be the, um, the topic of discussion. We're in the month of May, month of Mary. And so we're going to go over that with Kennedy tomorrow night. And then on Thursday, we actually changed the day. Thursday, we're going to talk about Our Lady of Fatima and the conversion of the Mohammedans. And so that's going to be a great show. We're going to talk about the future, the future triumph of Our Lady. So we got a few questions. Elijah, have you ever read The Jewish Peril in the Catholic Church written in 1936? If so, what are your thoughts on it? I wish I have. No, I have not, Elijah. If you've got a copy, send it over. Uh, address uh, Idrestada 5. What do we do when the true culture has been poisoned to the point where it becomes an anti-culture? Wouldn't that have to break away from the current elders to reestablish the true culture? I, in my opinion, I think it starts with the family. It starts with it's, uh, enthroning the sacred heart as the king of your family so that you start with your family. You reestablish the culture in your family, which is the epicenter of the culture. And then that is what allows us to convert the culture. If you wa watch the, the video from yesterday with Chris Plants, we talked about the kingship of Christ. It was very, he has got a lot of, lot of great thoughts on that. And that's, that's how we reestablish it. It starts with the family so that our sons and their sons and our daughters and their daughters will see the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. It's going to take years. We're probably going to die before we see it. But we need to understand that this is a, this is a long game. We need to establish the generations and establish the culture in our families. And that is what go is going to cause the counter-revolution, from my view. So uh, let me see. Timothy, how could God gives Brits and Americans, those these prot heretics, so much power and affect world domination since the 1800s? Well, one, God uses Babylon and Assyria and Rome, pagan Rome, for his own purpose. So God uses the nations 
in whichever way he feels. So he he will do what he wills, even with these pagan nations and empires. So it's not unheard of for God to use these different nations. And there are certain benefits for certain, certain uh, not as much the British the Americans, but when you talk about the Spanish and the Philippines, you know, and the uh, Portuguese spreading Christian civilization. Um, but how can you, how can God allow that? Well, I mean, the short answer is God's providence allowing that. And he does that with even pagan nations. So uh, let me get to another question here. Patty McGill. What's up, Patty? Um, the fake schismatics on Twitter claim that the Protestant cancer erupted because of inherent weakness in Catholicism. What is a Catholic response to that? I think you're talking about the Eastern Orthodox. Well, the the difficulty is that the Eastern Orthodox, they had their own schismatics. So they had the, the old schism, the old believers rascal in Russia, and they were unable to even deal with it because they can't call an ecumenical council. But the issue is basically kings. I mean, when you look at the history, the the difference between the Catholic the difference, what made the Reformation happen? This again to Belloc, what made the Reformation happen was that the power of the kings were able to get on its side. But this power of the kings is the same power that is on the side of the Eastern Orthodox. They also have the power of the the king. That's what caused really caught went at the schism of the between the eastern uh, east and west is, is the power of the king. So um, I think it's difficult to make that argument if you really know what Catholicism is. I have I have there's I can count on my one hand how many Eastern Orthodox I know who understand what Catholicism is. And so very few of them have read the sources about what Catholicism is. Um, I've challenged them on Twitter. You can look up on Meaning of Catholic. I, I, I've given my stipulations as to what Eastern Orthodox can do to dialogue with me. And I, I, God willing, I'll have one of them on. I'm talking with one of, one of my, my friends who's Eastern Orthodox. We'll, we'll talk more about that in the future. Um, but I'm going to take one more question. I got to wrap up here. Um, let's see. Honestly, I don't understand how Sacred Heart isn't Nestorian. Can, can you explain? Thank you. Well, it's not Nestorian because it's in the Holy Scriptures. When we talk about the Scriptures, we the our, our God has his heart. His heart is moved. There is a heart of uh, the, the thoughts of his heart. You know, there's these phrases in the Holy Scriptures that refer to God's heart, even without Jesus Christ. But... Nestorianism is, as a heresy, is separating the person of Jesus as man and separating him from Jesus and God, two different persons. So that is not, that is not, Nestor Sacred Heart is not Nestorianism because that is not separating the person. It is a, a devotion to Jesus Christ in his charity for mankind and the heart is universally understood to be the center of that love and the love for mankind. And so when we worship the sacred heart of Jesus, we are worshiping and giving thanks to Jesus Christ as a person for his love for us. So we are devoted to his heart. And when we say we are devoted to his heart, we are devoted to his person. We are not taking his heart out of his body, God forbid, and venerating the heart only separate from the person. That, that's just ridiculous blasphemy. That's not what anyone who practices the sacred heart devotion. That I mean, this is what Eastern Orthodox think of the sacred heart because they don't understand it. And so if you understand the sacred heart devotion, it is not a devotion to an organ. It is de a devotion to the person of Jesus Christ in his great love for mankind. That, I mean, that Eastern Orthodox should know that because their own liturgy says God is the lover of mankind. It's one of the, the epithets for God that's in the Greek rite. And so sacred heart is the devotion to the love of Jesus Christ. So that's and that's his the center of his person. That That is the center of his will. That, and so that's 
I, that's the best answer I can give on, on the fly here. But um, that's all I, time I have. I got to wrap up. Uh, so thanks so much for watching. I want to thank all of our patrons. Um, please support us. If you like these videos, please like, subscribe, uh, share the video. Um, and let's, so let's pray the Our Father. And we're going to pray for Christ's kingdom to come in our families and in our countries. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the